Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this week's webinar, which is certainly the start of a bit of a unique method uh, of us recording these uh, educational sessions. Uh, we at LandFX are all doing this quite remotely, um, as opposed to being centrally located in the LandFX headquarters, but we feel very fortunate to be able to continue operating like this uh, and providing our usual support and services every day and every week. Uh, my name is Damien. I work with our, mostly with our manufacturer partners and I'll be back, I'll be in the background moderating this week's guest webinar. Uh, again, I will say that we're fortunate to have Mike Warren uh, from Watertronics back to present the second part to rainwater harvesting for landscape irrigation. Uh, if you have not seen the first part or want to forward that on to someone else as a, as a preface to watching this, you can go to landeffects.com forward slash videos forward slash webinars and you can find that recording dated at February 21st, 2020. Uh, so again, this is something to keep in mind that while listening and, and coming up with questions, some questions might be more pertinent to that previous uh, webinar. But before I hand over to Mike, uh, we'll just go over our typical housekeeping items. Um, so for Q&A reminders, uh, we absolutely encourage questions and, and interactions with us each session. Um, so if you do have any questions uh, throughout the webinar, please type them into the Q&A window, which can be accessed by clicking on the Q&A button on your screens. Um, some of the questions will be answered directly by myself or other panelists in the background. Uh, otherwise, we'll have you know, a couple of moments at a midpoint in the presentation. And as always, we'll have time at the very end to uh, get some of those questions answered live uh, directly from Mike. Uh, but from here, I will hand over to Mike to um, go over a bit of a recap of, of what we covered last time and, and get us underway for, for this webinar. Thanks, Mike. All right, thank you, Damien. So for those of you who did get to join us for our first uh, webinar, I'll, for those who did, and I'll go over a quick review. Um, we went over the components of a rainwater system, uh, surfaces of collection, pre-filtration, uh, sizing and, and design, which is the a filter that's located before the storage tank, um, as well as uh, water storage options, tank sizing, uh, location on the property. Uh, in our second webinar here, we are going to get into the mechanic, mechanical portion of the rainwater system, which is the pump station controls, post filtration treatment and integration of ancillary equipment, like a secondary water supply, filtration, disinfection, um, as well as the two different types of rainwater systems that you'll see out there. Uh, one's called the direct style, one's called a, a day tank style. And at the end, we even have some example projects to take a look at if we have some time. So our general objective or solution with rainwater harvesting systems is, is we want to develop a, a water collection and distribution system that, that takes advantage of all the non potable water sources on a given property and then collects them stores it and reuses it for a non potable application and we want to do that automatically. Uh, with a water harvesting system, you are turning an owner and user into the purveyor of their own water supply. So everything that a city pump station does to purvey water to a community, one of these systems has to do on a commercial property. <clears throat> so our major components of a water system, water harvesting system, we're going to catch the water from a given surface, it can be rooftops, parking lots, sidewalks, a landscape area. Uh, we're going to filter that water before it gets into the storage tank. The best way to filter the water is at the source. The, the sooner we start filtering, keeping the leaves, sticks, debris out of the storage tank, the better our water quality is going to be, the less time, money, and effort we're going to spend on treating the water downstream. We're going to need to hold that water in, in some type of vessel, 
which could be a storage tank, something above ground, below ground, uh, something maybe cast into the building foundation, the pond. Uh, and then what we're going to focus in on more today, the last three here, I'll lump into one, pumps, controls, and post filtration and treatment. Um, here's the, the second part of getting the water ready to its desired quality for end usage. So if you joined us last time, um, you'll remember this slide where if we take a look at a, a commercial property, we have our potential sources of collection across the top and we're going to need to navigate through one or multiple of these bubbles to get to our end usage at the bottom. So on this call, we're primarily focused on our irrigation or landscape irrigation end usage. So if you take a look at a, a given property, you could have um, rainwater, stormwater, air conditioning, condensate uh, as potential sources of collection. You do see two up here in red, cooling tower, and gray water. Um, I put these in red to, to raise the flag that uh, the potential water quality that you could get from these sources may not be suitable for irrigation and promote healthy plant life. Uh, cooling towers have a bunch of uh, chemicals, anti-scalants uh, injected into the water that benefit the tower. Um, which cannot be filtered out with, with normal filtration you see on an irrigation system. Um, and those chemicals are probably harmful to plant life. Um, gray water, for those of you who don't know, gray water is classified as discharge from sinks, showers, and laundry. Also gonna contain uh, dissolved solids, chemicals, th um, things that are not good for, for plant life without extensive filtration. Not that uh, harvesting these two sources and reusing them for, for landscape irrigation couldn't be done, but you should raise the red flag because the, the treatment aspect of the water goes up exponentially compared to rainwater, stormwater, and air conditioning condensate water. So um, again, sources of water across the top of the screen here, and we're going to navigate through our components of a rainwater system to get to our end usage at the bottom. Our first component is a pre-filter, which is installed before the storage tank. You may have a different type of pre-filter, maybe one that incorporates, say, oil water separation, uh, if you're collecting water from a parking lot versus a hard surface rooftop. And then the water is going to come into the storage tank. We're going to need to pump that water out of the storage tank. That pump station is going to need to be controlled. We're going to need to ask ourselves if we need to provide a, a backup water supply or a secondary water supply from another source. 99% of the time it's, it's from the city supply to handle our irrigation system in the event that we don't have any rainwater to pump. And depending on the location and the type of irrigation system we have, we may need a screen filter or a screen filter and a method of disinfection um, to get to our end usage at the bottom here. So what does that all look like? Um, here is a, an example of a basic rainwater harvesting system that will collect water from a rooftop. It goes through a pre-filter in the upper left-hand corner here into our storage tank. And then we have a flooded suction pump station that in this case has a automatic discharge a filter on it. Uh, various controls and sensors, and it gets plumbed out to uh, irrigation. <clears throat> Quick review on pre-filters. Uh, again, the best way to filter the water is at the source. These are primarily removing uh, suspended solids from water. So they are a screen type filter, uh, barrier type filtration with the one exception, if you do have a a scenario where you're going to collect water from a uh, parking lot, you will mostly, most likely incorporate a filter that, that has screen filtration in it as well as an oil water separation. Uh, those are called hydrodynamic separators, which is the photo in the lower right hand corner here. And why do we pre-filter the water before the tank? Because nothing will negatively affect your water quality like decomposing organics in your storage tanks. We want to keep those items out of our storage tank because water will water will decompose anything. Water erodes rock given enough time. So anything 
that's left in the tank will start to decompose over time. And that's when our storage tank can start to turn, you know, septic or, or have a foul odor, color, uh, you name it. So we want to keep that stuff out of the storage tank as much as possible, both during construction and after the station is commissioned. <clears throat> In our last webinar, we also went over a bit on collection surfaces. Um, obviously, hard surfaces uh, produce the best water quality. Some things to watch out for, um, green roofs, uh, ballasted roofs with rock produce a slightly different water quality in our storage tank, which can affect some of our treatment components, which we're going to talk a little bit more in depth when we get to the disinfection component of the webinar today. And lastly, we talked about storage tanks in our first webinar. Um, again, storage can be any vessel that will hold water above ground, below ground, a cast into the building foundation, a pond on the property. Um, some highlights from our storage tank conversation. Uh, if we have an above ground storage solution, uh, we're going to look at limiting sunlight into the storage tank as much as possible. So we reduce a potential algae bloom in the tank. Uh, we also want to evaluate any snow and wind loads that we uh, may be encountering depending on where the tank is installed. If we have a below ground storage solution, um, we definitely don't have the sunlight problem like we do uh, in an above grade situation, but uh, we want to evaluate the potential for groundwater uh, of any kind and make sure that when we have a an empty tank and a possibly flooded a hole or excavation that we uh, make sure our tank is anchored sufficiently and a buoyancy calculation is done so we don't float any storage tanks uh, out of the ground to make them pop up like a submarine. So that's a brief view of uh, webinar number one. Um, so that brings us into the mechanical portion of a rainwater system um, starting with the pump station. So the pump station ends up being the heart of the rainwater system. It's the first component that gives the, the user or the operator that window into what's going on. Um, you know, unlike tanks and pre-filters uh, that have no electricity and no moving parts really connected to them, uh, the pump station will tell you things like flow and pressure of your pump, tank level. It's going to coordinate uh, the ancillary equipment that you have in addition to the actual pump and motor. So filtration, treatment, disinfection, level controls, alternate water supply. Here's where your alarms are going to live as well. And if you are looking to monitor this from say a remote source, uh, like maybe your your building has a, a building automation system, it will most likely be connected here as well. <laughs> so starting with the basics of a pump station, the first thing it does is obviously take the water from the storage tank and deliver it to our irrigation application. Uh, the pumps and rainwater harvesting systems are all centrifugal type pumps. So they all have a centrifugal style impeller, which means they have a characteristic as flow increases, pressure decreases. They are just installed in different types of pumping applications. So most commonly uh, seen are submersible style pumps uh, and then above grade horizontal, horizontal centrifugal pumping applications. We'll go into a little detail of each one of those here. <clears throat> so here's an example of a submersible pump station installed in a rainwater harvesting system. Just to walk you through the flow of water here, we'll collect water from our rooftop. It'll come down and go through our tank pre-filter and fill up our storage tank. Our submersible pump is located at the bottom of the storage tank here. And our, what we'll call a control skid, which houses the uh, electrical controls, filtration, treatment sensors uh, will live above grade here. <clears throat> and then we may or may not have disinfection on our pump station. And depending on our scenario, we are, may or may not incorporate a city water backup supply. But if we do, it is shown here as well. So submersible pump located in the storage tank, physically in, in the body of water. <clears throat> Our next pumping application you see in rainwater systems is called flooded suction. This is where the, the tank or the body of water we are pumping is located 
at the same elevation or higher than the actual pump intake. So instead of the pump being physically in the water, like a submersible application, it is next to the storage tank as you see here. And the water level in the tank is set up to be higher than the pump inlet pipe. So in more detail here, the photo on the left hand side, this round portion that you see being circled here on the screen is the actual pump intake pipe connection. So the water physically will run into the uh, pump intake and there are no priming issues uh, needed with this type of pump station. Same with submersible because the, the pump impeller that's inside the, the actual pump casing is physically either in the water or flooded with water as soon as the, the reservoir is filled up. Um, some pros and cons of each. Uh, the submersible pump application, uh, they tend to be a little more efficient so you can do the same performance with a little less horsepower. Uh, however, you have slightly uh, more challenging service side of things where if this pump motor needs to come out, uh, somebody's going to need to extract it from the tank and work on it above grade, where in a flooded suction application, the pump and motor is physically in an above grade enclosure here uh, where somebody can just open the lid and work on it as they, as they stand above grade so there's no confined space entry needed or, or advanced uh, equipment needed to, to lift something out of a, a storage tank. Our last pumping application we see in rainwater systems is called suction lift. This is where our body of water storage tank is actually below the intake of the pump, impel pump impeller. So the pump station physically have to lift physically has to lift the water from a lower elevation to the pump intake and then pressurize it out to our irrigation system. <clears throat> this has uh, limitations. Um, you can only lift water so much, typically around 10 to 15 feet max, depending on where you are in elevation. If you're around sea level, it's usually about 10 to 15 feet. Um, without going into too much detail, pumps have what's called a NPSHR value, which is stands for net positive suction head required. So it is related to uh, the atmospheric pressure at the given elevation you're at that you need to produce for the pump to perform to the curve that's published. Um, we can, if anybody has any questions about that, we can uh, talk offline about it. It's quite a, an extensive conversation, but just the thing to note with suction lift applications is that there is a limitation to in the distance from the low water level surface to the pump intake elevation that you cannot exceed or you actually can turn the pump on and it won't lift the water high enough and, and come out the, the discharge side of the pump. It does have its benefits just like the flooded suction application. However, the pump and motor is above grade easily accessible which makes service very easy compared to a submersible pump installed in a storage tank. <clears throat> Our control component of our rainwater system, um, it's probably larger than, you know, what you might expect. I get a, I get a lot of people around the country ask, you know, to put the, the controls of the system on a wall or, or mount the controls in a closet. And they may be thinking that the controls is a control box that's 12 inches by 12 inches wide, smaller than a microwave that you can just install on the wall. Um, these systems are operating uh, what can be, you know, up to, I'd say from maybe a one horsepower to a 10 horsepower, three phase electric motor. They're gonna incorporate uh, high voltage three phase power and then transform that all the way down to uh, low voltage D DC power for the various components in a control panel. Um, when looking at controls in a rainwater system, uh, it's best to, to note the environment they're getting installed in. Is this going to go indoors in a climately controlled building or room, or is it going to be installed outdoors in the elements? 
So you're going to want to specify a particular NEMA rating for your control cabinet for the environment. The electrical components inside the panel are going to generate heat. So the panel itself needs to be cooled and that cooling will need to be adjusted depending on the environment that it's in. It's in a in a mechanical room that's controlled at 73 degrees. That's very different than sitting outside uh, in the Arizona sun uh, in the middle of summertime. So your cooling requirements will change based on the environment. Uh, and it's also best to source a control panel that has uh, a third party listing or safety rating, um, such as UL or ETL. Uh, most electrical inspectors around the country are going to look for a third party listing on an electrical component that's installed in their given municipality. So when you look inside one of these control panels, uh, as I said earlier, you have everything from high voltage three phase power to, to low voltage DC power, depending on, on what's going on. Uh, this photograph here on the screen gives you a, a good visual of, of all the components inside required to run a pump and motor, level controls, filtration, and operator interface, which may be a LED screen or a touch screen that's going to tell that owner what his tank level is, what his alarm levels are at, what's the flow and pressure at any given time, um, you know, what his filter is doing, if his secondary water source is active, as well as allow him that window into the water harvesting system to make adjustments on when they want to turn on their city water or when they they want to activate uh, a manual flush on a filter. So we have everything from disconnect switches, circuit breakers, surge protectors, lightning arresters, especially if these are installed and in, uh, outdoor applications. Um, Florida, for example, has a very high lightning strike probability in their area of the country. <clears throat> um, rainwater systems are, are self-protecting. So all the alarms and safeties uh, that are needed, not just for the, the pump and motor, but to protect the irrigation system as, as well. So for example, a, a high pressure alarm um, is more for the irrigation mainline protection than it is, say, the pump and motor or the components on a pump station. Components on a pump station are probably built to withstand at least 150 to 200 PSI operating pressure, whereas some of the components downstream of the pump station may not be built to those, those pressure ratings. So there's alarms both that protect the equipment as well as some that protect uh, the distribution system connected to the pump station, in this case, the irrigation system. <clears throat> Example of an operator interface on a rainwater system. Um, again, it's going to tell you things like your tank level, alarm levels, how much city water you used, how much rainwater you used. That's a, an important one. If you are designing or installing a rainwater system for somebody, uh, Usually their first question after it's been installed for a year is that I installed this system that collects water and, and I did it to probably reduce my city water consumption. You know, how much rainwater did I save and how much city water did I not purchase? If we don't incorporate flow sensors or flow measuring devices on the system in various places and then display and record those values, uh, we can't tell the owner how much water they save. So it's important to, to look at all those sources of water and then measure them as well because we can't, uh, we don't know what we don't measure. I said earlier that a lot of the rainwater systems out there will use a secondary water source uh, as a backup supply. 99% of the time that's usually from the city. There are some parts of the country that have uh, treated effluent water. You'll see this as uh, purple pipe infrastructure around. So it'll be offered at a lower price or lower rate than city water. So you can actually um, set up level controls and we'll talk about this in a little bit 
in more more detail set up level controls to use uh, your least expensive water supply first in the event that you don't have rainwater available so making sure that we incorporate a control platform that can look at multiple levels or turn on multiple alternate water sources uh, can be a, a great benefit to the owner uh, or someone designing a rainwater system. <clears throat> so in addition again to controlling the pump and motor and regulating pressure, which is the, the core competency, if you will, the pump station. Its goal in life is to regulate a, a constant pressure at a variable flow rate. Um, it's going to control all the ancillary equipment as well. And the first uh, portion of our ancillary equipment here is the level controls and alternate water supplies. So our first question is, do we need to add a backup water source? So if we are out of rainwater, do we need to get water from another source or are we okay with just waiting until it rains again and, and then making an irrigation decision? We need to decide if that, that backup water source is going to go into our reservoir or it's gonna be plumbed direct to the water distribution system, the irrigation main line. <clears throat> Once we've made that decision, we have to look at, does our backup water supply have the proper flow or proper flow and pressure to satisfy the demand, what we're asking it, it to do? Um, there's a couple different scenarios and questions or answers that uh, we'll look at that'll make that decision for us. And uh, we'll take a look at each one. So option one is putting a backup water supply. We'll, for our example here, we'll call it from the city uh, into our into our storage tank. So we have a full rainwater tank. We are irrigating, pumping the level down in the tank. When it hits a, a lower set point, we're going to open a valve from a pressurized city supply and that city water is gonna go into the storage tank. So we have to verify a few things if we want to set up uh, this scenario. First, we have to verify that the city water has the same flow, greater than or equal to the same flow as our max zone or what our pump station is designed for. So if we are pumping out to our irrigation system at 60 gallons per minute, but we are only filling our storage tank with 12, it's only going to be a matter of time before we have depleted the last little bit of the storage tank pump will shut down on a low level alarm and we'll have to wait for the fill source to catch up. <clears throat> so number one, I'm going to verify that the city supply has greater than or equal to the same flow as the pump station or the largest zone in the irrigation system. Whenever we're connecting a, a potable water supply such as the city, to a non-potable water system, such as a rainwater system, there always has to be a method of backflow prevention. So we do not contaminate the potable city water supply with the non-potable rainwater. This is usually achieved two ways. There's either a physical air gap where the piping from the city water supply must stop six to 12 inches above the, the maximum water surface uh, of the non-potable water system or there's a RPZ or backflow preventer installed on the city supply, which is a physical device that does not allow a reversal of flow. Uh, so when you have that connection from a non-potable source to a potable source, uh, it uses the theory that if the flow would should be reversed in the pressurized piping system that the device dumps or stops that flow from happening. Pretty common in, in the irrigation world uh, whenever there's a irrigation main line that's connected to a city water pressurized supply. There's usually a RPZ or backflow preventer of some kind as well as a city water meter um, on, on that POC point of connection. So in a tank fill scenario, the level controls 
actually should be set up to maintain a low water level in the storage tank. So we have a full tank of rainwater, we're irrigating, pumping it down, pumping it down. We hit a, a low water condition, not a low level alarm, but a low condition that we wanna open up the city fill valve. We wanna open up that city fill valve but we also want to close it right away as well. The last thing we want to do is open up the city fill valve at a low point and fill the entire storage tank up with city water and then close the valve. We want to open and close that city fill valve just a couple inches above the pump minimum submergence or the, the pump alarm set point. Therefore, leaving the most amount of room in the storage tank to harvest the next rain event. It's just the setting up of those open and close levels and those level, con level controls has a drastic effect on the success of the rainwater harvesting system as a whole. The other thing you want to note, which isn't shown on here, uh, is that you want to make sure that you set the, the off level for the city fill valve below the overflow invert elevation on your storage tank. If it is accidentally set up higher than the overflow invert elevation on your storage tank, you can actually never hit that value. The city valve is open and the water's rising up in the tank and going right out the, the overflow pipe. Our second method of integrating a backup water supply uh, is plumbing that direct to distribution or direct to the irrigation main line with a two-way valve or a three-way valve of some kind. <clears throat> so first we have to make sure that our local codes will allow this type of connection. So in this case we are physically threading or plumbing a potable water pipe to a non-potable connection. So our air gap as a method of backflow prevention here is, is not applicable. So our only choice is an RPZ or backflow preventer. So your local municipality has to be okay with this type of connection. And that varies uh, state to state and even city to city. Um, where I'm from here in Wisconsin, uh, we see both. I know there's parts of the country that only allow an air gap. For example, San Francisco, uh, the Boston area, Massachusetts, uh, San Antonio, or a couple of areas of the country that only allow an air gap. Um, Los Angeles uh, allows a direct connection with a three-way valve or an air gap. And again, that changes per city and per state, so it's best to check with your AHJ authority having jurisdiction on, on what's allowed. But if, if it is allowed, we need to verify a couple of things just like our other scenario. Our backup water must have the same flow, again, right, because we have the same issue with flow. If we don't have the same, the great, the same flow as our largest irrigation zone or, or pump station is sized for, we're not gonna be able to satisfy our demand. And here we also have to verify pressure. In the tank fill scenario, we didn't have to verify pressure because we were putting it into an atmospheric storage tank and the pump station was going to repressurize it to our, our set point, whatever we needed for irrigation, call it 60 PSI. Uh, in this situation, we need to verify flow and pressure. And that's at the point of connection to our rainwater skid, which is going to be right near the, the start of the irrigation main line. So that's got to be after a city water meter, after an RPZ, after whatever pipe run distance we may have at our maximum flow rate, we need to make sure that we have enough flow and pressure uh, to satisfy our irrigation demand. And then we need to set up our control logic to switch back and forth between city water and, and rainwater in the storage tank as the rainwater is available. So that is the primary this deciding factor, obviously, on when to switch to our backup water supply. Our tank is full. We're going to start irrigating. We've used all our rainwater. The irrigation control is still calling for zones to be open. The pump shuts down because it recognizes a low level and it switches to our city water supply 
and heads out to the irrigation main line. You can do some, some more advanced controls or decision making in this type of scenario when you plumb the city water direct. So if you were to talk to an owner and ask them, say, you know, when would you like your, your city water to, to be enabled? Uh, usually their first response is, well, as soon as the rainwater uh, is empty in my storage tank, I want to turn on the city water. That's true, but that's actually about, that's one of 14 conditions that you would, you would want to flip to city water. Since your city water is plumbed direct, it can act as a 100% redundant backup for you in multiple scenarios. What an owner actually wants, I think, is whenever there's a problem with my rainwater system or pump station as a whole, flip over to city water so I don't miss an irrigation cycle. If you just flipped over to city water on tank volume, any one of those other scenarios may not engage city water. And if you look at an irrigation pump station, it has a whole bunch of alarms on it. There's things like high pressure alarm, low pressure alarm, high voltage alarm, low voltage alarm, discharge filter alarm, VFD alarm if it has one. There's, there's a bunch of them depending on which type of pump station you have. So if you set it up so that the city water flips over and takes control whenever the pump is disabled, not just on low tank level, because that's only one of the scenarios the, the pump could be disabled on, you provide a much more dependable water supply for the end user. He has a much lower probability of missing an irrigation cycle uh, if you flip the city water over on any one of the conditions that could disable the system. Uh, before I get into filtration and treatment, um, let's pause for a quick second. Damien, is there any questions we have yet? Um, yeah, just got a, a couple actually. Um, going back to the pump stations for a second, um, I was wondering if you could maybe give us a, uh, a best or a common landscape project type that maybe is is best suited to, you know, the use of a submersible pump, uh, pump versus a flood, uh, flooded suction pump versus a suction lift pump. Um, or is it really so situational and contextual that it's hard to, to kind of generalize like that? Um, I would say it's mostly driven off of the type of tank you're buying. That's probably what dictates it the most. So if you have a below ground tank, you're most likely going to use a submersible pump. Um, you could use a suction lift pump in that scenario as well because the water surface is below the actual pump or it could be below the, the pump station above grade. Um, however, if you, f if you take the rule of thumb that the average tank in the US is buried at least three feet below the ground and the tank is anywhere from you know eight to 10 foot diameter and, and take into grades, you find that you approach the the maximum lift you can you can do with a with a horizontal centrifugal pump pretty quickly based on the elevations. And the other thing with suction lift is that the pump functioning properly is very hev heavily weighted on the integrity of the suction line uh, connected to it. So if there's any small leak on the suction side of the pump or that piping, or if it's, if it's not installed completely horizontal or declining slope to the water surface, meaning if it has a, if it has to go up and over something, um, it's going to cause the pump to lose prime and, and not operate properly. So the, the nuisance or the, the probability of losing prime and suction lift is, it can be quite high. So you'll find that people will uh, revert to a, a submersible pump usually in a below ground tank scenario. And they usually default to a flooded suction style pump in an above ground tank scenario. Those are probably the two most common applications uh, around the country and they're, and they're dictated 
by the type of tank that's installed in the rainwater system. Okay, great. And um, when looking at the right pump station for your project, uh, what is the main determination in choosing the horsepower for that pump? The pump size is dictated by the irrigation system actually. So your pump needs to be sized to provide the flow and pressure you need at the start of the irrigation mainline in the worst case scenario. So the worst case scenario is going to be whatever your largest zone is on your irrigation system. And then whatever pressure that that's going to need to be to deliver water to that zone. And that'll be a function of is that zone high on a hill or is it or is it not, you know, how many feet of main line is between the pump station and that worst case zone. Um, that's usually the way it's set up. Now you can, if you have the flexibility, you, you can do it the other way. You can pick a pump station and zone your irrigation design to fit a pump station application, which mostly comes into play when you have a municipality requiring you to purchase a system that's that's listed or built to a given standard, right? So to keep that the mechanical system within that standard, sometimes it's easier to modify the irrigation design around the pump station. But that may not always work because you have things that come into play like watering window or time of day restrictions on when you can water. And so if you can only water for two hours a day and you need a higher volume or higher GPM rated pump station, uh, that's gonna override, you know, you purchasing something that's pre-canned and set for 10 gallons a minute, for example, but you need to provide 50 gallons a minute because you only have a two hour water window. Great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, really good things to keep in mind. Um, we don't have any other questions at the moment, so feel free to keep on going. Okay. So we're going to move into filtration and treatments. <clears throat> so in our first webinar, we talked about filtering the water before the storage tank to keep the leaves, sticks, debris out of the, out of the storage tank. Um, to, to keep a good water quality. Uh, we are now going to filter that water again, but on the pressurized side of the pump. So on the pump station, uh, we're going to filter the water to keep debris out of our irrigation main line and to keep things like say drip emitters from, from plugging up. So uh, in a landscape irrigation application, the, the finest filtration you see is about 100 micron. So you will see uh, some type of, of barrier type filter, whether it's stainless steel screen or bag filter or cartridge filter uh, on the pump station that <laughs> keeps that debris larger than 100 micron out of the main line. So there's two types of filters you can look at. There's a manual filter, which is something that requires disassembly, cleaning, manual intervention to uh, rectify it when it gets plugged or there's an automatic filter. Um, the irrigation industry uh, is pretty much graduated to automatic filtration. Um, I think a lot of people on the call are probably familiar with the automatic filters that are available out there, whether they be Techlean, Amiad, VAF, or of all Filtamat. Um, they all essentially uh, are an automatic screen filter. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have a filter on your pump station, you're probably relying on these small zone filters that are out in the irrigation field and the irrigation main line prior to the zone valves. And if those get plugged up, you run the risk of having a maintenance guy go around to each one of the manual zone filters and cleaning those out manually. An automatic filter positioned back on the pump station keeps all that debris out of the irrigation main line, out of the drip emitters, out of the sprinkler heads, uh, cleans itself automatically, which provides a more of an uninterrupted water service uh, to the end user. 
So one caveat with the level of discharge filtration on a pump station, or I had just said that drip irrigation is about the, the smallest filtration size you'll see at 100 micron. Um, that will change if you utilize a UV unit for disinfection. So more and more, uh, I'm starting to see the requirement for disinfection needed for irrigation water. <clears throat> so the first uh, the first step in this, you know, in creating this solution is does the water need to be disinfected? Um, and that can be a driver of local municipality requiring it or designing to one of the standards that are out there. Um, the type of irrigation system you have, uh, for example, a drip irrigation system is not going to require any form of disinfection because the the water leaves the irrigation system and the drip emitter right in you know at surface or grade there, uh, at right at the plant root, if you will, um, versus a a spray irrigation system which broadcasts it through the air. So what what you could be concerned with is the broadcasting of that non-potable water supply through the air and somebody coming in contact with it or you know inhaling that that uh, that aspirated water and there's no hard rule of thumb as to when it requires disinfection or, or when it doesn't in, in the irrigation world. Um, it's another one of those things that varies per state and per city as well. So the, the question is, does the rainwater system need a disinfection component to it? Yes or no? No? Okay, then we're fine with just a screen filter. If yes, then we have to ask ourselves, okay, what device are we going to use to disinfect the water? Because there's about five or six common ways that you can disinfect water. There is ultraviolet light, residual chlorine, ozone, ultrafiltration, which is a membrane technology, reverse osmosis, which is a membrane technology. I think there's also another one called copper silver ion. Um, but at the end of the day, the most common and affordable ones I see in the irrigation industry is, is UV. Um, chlorine can be used, but it's tricky because you, you get into possibly endangering plant life. Uh, plants don't like chlorinated water. <laughs> so UV is by far the most common one that I've seen uh, incorporated into rainwater systems around the country. So if you are using UV as your method of disinfection, you have to tighten up your filtration ahead of the UV unit. So that 100 micron filter is probably going to go down to something 25 micron or, or smaller. And we'll talk about that in, in just a second. Um, and we have to really be conscious of what the water is touching or coming in contact with before it gets to the storage tank. So the thing with UV is you can't just send any water you want into a UV unit and it magically disinfects it. It has water quality prerequisites that it has to meet. Um, <clears throat> mainly uh, so the driver in that is, is called UVT or ultraviolet transmittance, which is a measure of how the light can move through the water that you're giving the UV unit. So earlier we talked about collecting water from a green roof and it had, uh, if you remember this photo from earlier, it has a bunch of dissolved solids in the water. So there's two things that, that make up water besides the H2O part. You have total suspended solids and total dissolved solids. The suspended solids, depending on what size they are, are things you can filter out or remove from the water. The dissolved solids, you cannot. So an example of dissolved solids in the water, uh, 
food coloring dye in water, salt and salt, uh, dissolved in water, so salt water. Those are things that are dissolved in the water. You can't run that through a screen and, and filter it out. So this photo here in the bottom left, it, this is a water sample collected from a green roof. If you set this on your desk and let it sit there for six months, the stuff never falls out of suspension in the water. It's still that yellow color six months from now. So things like decomposing organics have a negative effect on your ultraviolet transmittance of your water. So the UV light can't get through the water to disinfect those organisms. So it goes into alarm and, and you have an issue. So if you're going to use UV light to disinfect water, we need to make sure that we keep as much organics out of the storage tank as possible and we're collecting from some sort of hard surface rooftop. Uh, metal, glass, asphalt shingles, um, you know, clean concrete, some hard surface. When you get into organic surfaces, or even some parking lots can be, can be pretty bad, but like landscaped areas, synthetic turf, uh, ponds that, that have drainage around uh, in them that runs over the, the turf or, or landscape and plantings into the pond. They have a high organic load and that organic load uh, can negatively affect ultraviolet transmittance. So when sizing a UV unit, you look at three sets of criteria. Dose, which is the amount of energy it measured in millijoules per centimeter squared, which is energy over the area of the UV unit. So a UV unit is a chamber. It's a light bulb inside a chamber. So how much energy the bulb gives off over the area of the chamber. Each organism uh, that you want to disinfect has what's called a, a destruction level. So it's how much UV energy it takes to inactivate that organism. So let's take E. coli for example. Uh, e. coli requires 6.6 .6 millijoules of 254 nanometer wavelength UV energy to inactivate it. And that basically means uh, it's like a three log reduction. So that means to, to inactivate 99.99% of E. coli, you need to give it 6.6 .6 millijoules of UV energy. <laughs> It'll, it will disinfect that organism if the ultraviolet transmittance of your water is what you designed for. So let's just say we're going to pick a UV unit that's sized for 30 millijoules of dosage at 75% transmittance water or better. And we're gonna pick a maximum flow rate of 30 gallons a minute because the flow rate is basically the, the time in the chamber, right? Because the higher the flow rate is in a given pipe size, the faster it moves, therefore the, in feet per second, therefore the less time it's actually in the chamber. So these things are all interlinked. If you size it for, let's just look at our condition there, 30 millijoules, 75% UVT at uh, 40 gallons a minute. They're all directly related. If we pump less than 40 gallons a minute, we're going to get something more than 30 millijoules of energy delivered in the water. If we size it for 75% transmittance water and we actually give it 92% transmittance of water, we're going to get something more than 30 millijoules delivered into the water. It also works in reverse. So if you designed it for 75% transmittance water and you gave it 50, you're going to get less than 30 millijoules delivered in the water. So they're interrelated. And I could go on a whole, probably a whole nother hour just on UV design. If anybody has any questions on those or wants to get more in depth into it, please feel free to, to email me later and, and, and we can talk about it. But the takeaways from this webinar are there's water quality prerequisites from if you want to use UV to disinfect water and most of them are affected by what the water touches on its way to the storage tank, not quite related to 
how fine a filtration you had ahead of you have ahead of, ahead of the UV unit. The the filtration will go from a drip irrigation system that's at 100 micron to again something probably 25 micron or smaller ahead of the UV unit. And from the suspended solids vantage point, you just want to remove items in the water that could cast shadows in the UV chamber and those microorganisms can hide behind those shadows and not get touched by that UV light and therefore get through the UV chamber without getting inactivated. Quick uh, frame of reference for 25 micron. Um, your naked eye can probably see things down to around the 50 micron level. So at 25 micron and smaller, you're filtering stuff out of the water that you probably can't even see. So it's relatively small. So our treatment train, you know, what the water comes in contact with in the drainage system, our pre-filter before the storage tank, the storage tank itself, all of this stuff works in concert with each other to produce the best water quality possible. I did mention chlorine. We'll briefly talk about chlorine because it's really not used much in, in irrigation application because it can be potentially harmful to plant life. But I think it's important that we kind of know how, how it works, its theory. Um, so chlorine is, uh, it's an oxidizer. It, it will actually kill viruses, pathogens, uh, whatnot. So depending on the level of chlorine in the water, it will, it will kill those, those organisms. Usually you want to try and maintain one to, to two parts per million at most. So it's really, really small concentration of chlorine we're trying to maintain because it is so potent. Um, just for frame of reference, one part per million is like one eye droplet of water in 11 gallons of milk. It's small, small concentrations. <clears throat> um, so chlorine works on a contact time. And what you, what you end up designing is a system that recirculates a body of water, your storage tank, for example. And it, its goal is to maintain what's called the residual chlorine level. So you inject chlorine in the water, it reacts with things in the water and it becomes consumed. Once you've built up a residual level of chlorine and there's actually sensors that measure residual level of chlorine or free chlorine in the water, once you've built up that residual level, it's not reacting with anything in the water anymore. Um, therefore, the water is disinfected. And chlorine has a, has a contact time that's required as well. You can't just put it in the water and it's instantly disinfected everything there. It has a contact time, which is why you recirculate it on a body of water. And the other, the other aspect to, to chlorine is since it is an oxidizer, it does have an effect on the color of water, which isn't a, a big driver or, or concern in landscape irrigation industry, um, more so in uh, in our interior building applications where we collect rainwater, but it will, it will have a positive effect on, on water color given uh, a long enough amount of time. <clears throat> so lastly, we're going to go over the two types of systems, uh, types of system design uh, for rainwater harvesting systems. The first one's a direct style system where we are using the water in our storage tank that's going to be pumped and pressurized directly to our given application, in this case landscape irrigation. Uh, all the components uh, on the pressurized side of the pump are sized for the max flow rate and everything happens real time. So this is an example of what's called a direct style system. We have our pump in our storage tank and it's going to be activated most likely on a pressure drop or say a signal from an irrigation controller. The pump's going to turn on, it's going to provide the flow and pressure required that's dictated by the irrigation system because a pump station is a slave to the demand. Number of zones or sprinkler heads that are open, its goal in life is to satisfy that demand at any given point in time. So it's going to pump in real time through a filter and whatever treatment devices we have right out to our irrigation system. 
direct style system. Same thing in this photo. One pump station taking an atmospheric tank, pressurizing it to our irrigation main line. The second type of designs that are out there, it's called the transfer in a day tank system where it actually uses two pump stations. This is also called batch processing. That is done with the first pump, say in your main storage tank here, it's going to transfer that water through your filtration and treatment and put it into what's called a day tank. And then you're gonna use another pump station to pressurize it out of your day tank and send it to your given application. And the city water is 99% of the time plumbed to the day tank. <laughs> now, the transfer and day tank system really doesn't work for irrigation, but I show it on the screen here to, to identify the differences in the hydraulic reasons uh, as to why you use one or the other. <clears throat> There's four deciding factors. <clears throat> the first one uh, is based on pressure. So if you have a system that operates at really high PSI, locating filters and, and disinfection units at, at a super high pressure is probably tough, um, or they have a super long lead time. So you may um, default to something that processes or batch processes the water at a lower pressure and then puts it in a clean water holding tank and you repressurize it again. Um, the second one is flow or GPM. Uh, this doesn't quite apply in the irrigation world. It's more of an interior building application thing, but not that you can't find filters and treatment units rated for any GPM you want, you can, um, but it may be more advantageous to transfer the water at a smaller flow rate through a smaller filter and UV unit, and then pump it out of a clean water tank or day tank uh, at a higher capacity GPM with, with another pump station. So you save that, you save that money there. If you graph the cost versus the size of components, um, you know, there's a break somewhere in that 100 to 200 GPM range so that makes the decision one way or the other. However, in an irrigation world, we are mostly bound uh, by number four here which is the application of the usage profile. Number three is our footprint. Obviously, if, if footprint only allows for one size or the other, that's gonna override some of our design factors, but we really wanna focus in on number four here because the usage profile is what really dictates the, the decision in the irrigation world. So if you look at an irrigation cycle, it's gonna come up, in, and ramp up and run for hours at a time at some fixed GPM rate. This particular example shows 200 gallons a minute, but it could be 50, 60, 20, whatever it is. An irrigation system is gonna come and then operate for a length of time and then it's gonna shut off. It's gonna go through an irrigation cycle. When you look at that compared to how a building uses water, it's all over the place. It's very erratic. It's gonna have spikes, but they're not very long in duration. This is people flushing toilets and using showers and, and whatnot. <clears throat> so when you go to apply these two things to the batch processing example, you find that if you have an irrigation system 99.9% .9 of the time you're going to end up with a direct style system because if you try to batch process in an irrigation system, it's very nature of operating for at a at somewhat constant GPM for hours at a time is going to either cause you to upsize this pump or upsize this storage tank so large that you're not saving any of the money. And again, we can, I can go into that more detail. We're about out of time, uh, but I put that up on the screen to, to show the differences in the hydraulic reasons, you know, one way or the other. Um, and just note that this is, if you see a transfer in a day tank system on an irrigation application, it should probably raise a red flag and, and look at the hydraulics 
and the usage profile um, because it's it's really you're going to end up pumping it out of here so fast that you're going to say oh I need to put it in the day tank at the same rate or this day tank is going to hit a low level alarm so you end up upsizing this pump to the same size as this pump and then you just bought two pump stations at the same size so again we can go over that in more detail uh, for anybody who has any questions again feel feel free to email me um, we are about out of time there's a couple of of case study examples here um, in our first uh, webinar, we talked about one of the surfaces of collection being a splash pad where the children's play fountain there in a park and the, the water is on on the splash pad from say, I don't know, noon to four uh, during the day. And you can collect that water from the splash pad. It's potable water from the city because the, it's coming in contact with, with little kids and humans. Um, you can collect that water from the splash pad and then reuse that water to irrigate the same park that the splash pads in. And this particular example had a below ground tank installed right here. Uh, this is this actual splash pad and the control skid is above grade right next to the splash pad here. So there's a submersible pump in the tank and there's a control station here with a discharge filter in the enclosure. This is the pressurized pipe from the pump in the tank and this is the irrigation mainline connection over here and this is the filter flush pipe that goes to waste or drain. This particular one was one of those examples where they dug the hole right next to the ocean. You can kind of see in the background here. So this was a, when they dug down in the ground here, the groundwater seeped in pretty quickly. So this was a, an example where they had a fully flooded hole or excavation with a below ground tank installation. This, above grade example here, collected water from this commercial building and is stored in these two large above ground storage tanks. And there's a flooded suction pump station application next to the storage tanks. It had a horizontal centrifugal pump and a 100 micron automatic filter in it with city water backup that filled the storage tanks. And they irrigated the landscape area that you can kind of see behind it here, which was in a, a lunchtime area for the employees of the commercial property. So quick summary, um, as you guys can see the, the range of water harvesting can be pretty vast. Um, looking at, you know, the intent and, and the budget ahead of time and what the, the owner is ultimately looking to get out of it uh, can, can help you design um, the right system and, and meet their overall budget for sure. Uh, they range from small to large, you know, something, a residential project might have something as small as a 55 gallon drum underneath a rain gutter out back with a pump that you plug in into a 120 volt outlet to uh, a large commercial system that, uh, you know, collects water from say 60,000 square feet of greenhouse and then irrigates all the plants uh, within the greenhouse uh, property there. So they're, they're quite quite vast and, and range from small to large, but at the end of the day, they will all have the same components. They will have a collection surface, a pre-filter, a storage tank, pump controls, filtration and treatment, and you just move them around the property and change the size of them uh, depending on the input parameters. <clears throat> that is all I had. Um, Damien, do we have any questions at the end here? Uh, we just got one question um, relating to, I guess, the filters and, and installation in re relation to pump stations. Um, would you want those filters to be installed before or after the pump station? Um, does it matter? And, and what are the spacing distances between, you know, the various pieces of equipment? You know, is there a minimum um, for it to be operating at its, uh, its optimum levels. So was it, was it talking about the, the filters on a pump station or any filters in general in the rainwater system? Um, let's go with any. Okay. So there's two locations in the rainwater system, which we, we filter the water. One of them is the pre-filter before the storage tank. So that is installed anywhere between the roof and the inlet of the storage tank. 
um, doesn't matter where, just as long as there is a filter somewhere between the collection surface and the storage tank to keep that debris from collecting and decomposing in the storage tank. And then we will have uh, another filter on the discharge of the pump station, which is on the pressurized side of the pump. And that is used to filter the water one more step finer or better than that tank pre-filter did. Okay, sorry, uh, I was just seeing another question come through. Um, yeah, that, that answers that question, I think. Uh, let's see, so are there any filters to deal with uh, urea from synthetic surface dog runs? There might be, but I don't know of any off the top of my head. Okay, yeah, I mean, that, that might be a, a, I'd have to a do question some research on that one. or a discussion for yeah, um, outside of, of this session. But um, yeah, because we are, you know, just, just sort of over time, uh, there are no other questions at this stage. Um, we will just sort of wrap things up, but um, as Mike, uh, to everyone, as Mike mentioned, if you do have any further questions or want to discuss some of the more detailed subtopics that were either brought up in, in this session or that you have uh, further thoughts on, you can contact Mike directly. directly. Um, his information is, is on screen, as you can see. Um, but as always, we are posting this webinar up on our website later this afternoon. And it will be there if you would like to rewatch or pass it on to someone who especially watched the first session but couldn't make it to this one. Um, but in finishing up, I want to thank Mike uh, again for his time in preparing for and presenting these last couple of webinars. Um, you know, it's been a couple of months worth, but it's been a great mini series and hopefully really helpful to everyone who's taken part or uh, watch these recorded webinars. So again, thank you, Mike. Uh, and to everyone at the moment, please be smart, stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, have a great weekend. All right, thanks everyone.